Hey, Sam, you come up with that intro line? You didn't tell me that was today. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Writer's Room with Sam and Jim. This is the show where we bring aspiring writers into our little writer's room here and try to help them work on and develop their story. And we're going to do that with Giovanna Huguet-Burke in just a minute. But first, Sam wants to go off about something. Sam, what the hell is it now? Here's what I've been thinking about lately. It's an impossible question, but it's a question that I think every writer has to deal with all the time. Unfortunately, sometimes at two in the morning, which is, am I any good? Oh, Oh, that's a tough one. And there's so many different phases of that question. And I was thinking about all of our phases of that question. Phase one for us was we were trying to write features and then we came to LA and we stumbled. We went to Book City. Book City. We found some Simpson scripts and sitcom strips, scripts, and we read them in that Chinese restaurant down on Pico. And, and we were just sitting in a booth and with this revelation, like, oh my God, we could write this. And then we went back to Minnesota and we did. And we we, we wrote the, our first script out of the gate. It was The Simpsons, and it was great. And it, we were like, oh, my God, we can do this. This is so good. And, and mentally, we both started entertaining the possibility that we might actually get a, a it job. could be possible. A career as writers in Hollywood. And even though it was a long road to get there, that we, and we didn't know what it looked like, it seemed doable because we had done it. Okay, we're good. Now we start writing other sitcoms and they get progressively worse because we don't know what the hell we're doing and because you need to write scripts to get the bad out and also right. to, uh, to learn the craft. And we couldn't take classes and we didn't have podcasts and all that kind of stuff. And so we were just trying, trying, writing, writing, and we were getting worse and worse and worse. And I was like, oh my God, this is really, we're not getting any better uh, why is that? And then you and then then you have that sort of existential angst. But then we decided anyway to move out because the we both got the bug, and this answered questions for us. You wanted to be a writer since you were born, and I, I wanted to be in television, and writing seemed like a great way to do it. And we moved out here, and then we were all alone. We were, we had friends, and we were married, but it was nobody in Hollywood certainly cared that we were out there. And you just you just feel like you're, you're failing. And we took a class to remind you at UCLA, yeah. and we would drive through the hills, and I'd smell the eucalyptus, and it started to smell like failure to me. And I started to associate that eucalyptus flavor uh, scent <laughs> with us, and particularly me, failing at this thing and how impenetrable Hollywood was. And then a woman we were working for at the time, and she was a writer, and she encouraged us to write drama. And we did. We wrote a West Wing, and it was good. And we knew it was good. And it actually opened some doors, and, and it helped us write, and we found more of our voice. And then we were good again. And then I felt good again. And then, you know, go through different phases, and we got hired to write a feature, and we did this. And every every so often, we, we got in like the guild. We got in the guild, and I thought, okay, we can do this. And then we got a show on the air, and then it was interesting because some people would read our scripts and think, oh, my God, this is so, this is great. And the other people would read it and be like, I, no, I don't get it. I don't think these guys know what they're doing. And you start to develop that skin where you just, you, you, you try to hopefully have it be the kind of skin that can absorb the flattery. <laughs> the combo. And repel the pain. <laughs> yeah, and repel the people dogging you and because you're not going to please everybody. And then there were these things in there that I don't want to go into, but they really went after our confidence. Yeah. And I think luckily we had each other to say, you know, whether we were deluding each other or not, it's not us, it's them. And then we got onto, we went onto a different show. And then there was that moment where the showrunner pulled us aside and said, I don't know why you guys are partners because you're both really good writers. And it was like, you know, it was almost hard to hear. Yeah. Like, cause we, we'd been trained for so long that we were terrible. At that point, and yeah. we'd gotten a lot of really bad feedback, and uh, and it was mostly because there was one dude that didn't like us, and he, unfortunately, he was a network president. So, <laughs> but <laughs> and then we were, and then things really blossomed after that, and they got better. But you're constantly going back and forth between am I good, your internal am I good, your external you know, people telling you you're good or not good. Some people we watch as they are told they're good by fame and fortune. And we think to ourselves, they're not really that good at what they're doing, but what is the measure? And Good versus successful. Good versus successful. And then other people who are successful and they deserve every last bit of it because right. they're, they're, they're really good at they it. Work their asses off. Yeah. And they're, and they're talented and, and everything and all points in between. So the 
the question that I have for myself and for you <laughs> is, and I think this is the one that we all struggle with as writers, are, are we any good? And when do we ever know whether we're good or not? And when does this madness end? <laughs> that's what I want to know. And that's all I want to talk about today. Okay, let's get into this week's show. Hey, how's it going? How are you? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Good. We're super excited to talk to you for about a bunch of reasons, but the one that I'm really excited about is you are our first working actor slash writer. Second, we're second. Mary Birdsong. Oh, that Mary Birdsong. Okay. I want to hear what it's like from you. Were you a writer and then became an actor or were you like, were you in a long-term marriage and then suddenly realized that you were gay later? How did that work? <laughs> <laughs> I can't fight this anymore. I, I love my can't husband. Fight the feeling anymore? Right. What? What? What happened? <laughs> well, I was an actor first, and I just loved creating characters so much. I I wanted to dig deeper, and when I went down the rabbit hole, I just got stuck into this writing world. <laughs> I know we all know that actors create the characters a lot. I mean, they really mm -hmm. find stuff. And I don't know if you do this, but I'll watch shows where I'll realize none of the lines of dialogue are telling me anything about the actor, uh, the character, but the actor mm -hmm. is bringing it, right? Right. And mm -hmm. that's what's doing it because it's a procedural say and they're yeah. investigating some crime, and then the, but there's a flavor on it and it's got to be all the actor because I don't see how... It's not in the words. It's not in the words. It's not in the <laughs> scenes. It's not in the actions. It's it's just because that actors bring so much. And I assume, right. I assume you do that too. Yeah. I mean, that's what made me love writing so much is that I would always just dig so deep in the characters. Like I'd always, I always do. And I always create like backstories, you know, cause you don't really get much when you get a breakdown, you get like two sentences about this person and right. then you get the script. So you have to like analyze the script and find everything and find all those little pieces that could maybe turn into something and try to create this character. And that's the part of acting aside from the performance, but I just love that part the digging. That's probably the part that most writers would benefit from thinking about more is doing that. That because a lot of writers, at least starting out, tend to worry about the world building and the mythology and the plot when a little mm -hmm. more time spent on those characters and thinking about the background could throw a lot more flavor into their scripts. It's right. true. It's true. And they, you know, you want to figure out, well, what are the rules of the planet of Xenon? Uh, that's going to come up in <laughs> season three. And I think it's really important that we know what their, their race is like <laughs> now so I can set it up. I feel like Jim and I are total frauds in this moment because completely we, because we are <laughs> We, well, this is why we're on we're on draft twelve of a big sci-fi space thing, and the notes, the most consistent notes we've gotten are character notes, and we find them so galling because they're right, and because we're like we know the rules, but we wanted to have one where we really unpacked the characters very slowly, and uh, and then the agents were like, I don't know, understand these characters. And we're like, No, no, you're gonna understand them later. <laughs> And they're like, there is no later, there's only a pilot. We're like, oh, that's what we tell people all the time. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Oh and, man, I feel you on that. Yeah, and we've yeah. sold so many pilots and worked on so many shows, and then it's, it's like there's five rules, and you're gonna, I feel like we're going to break them all the time. And on, then, on a good day, you remember one. Yeah, while you're actually <laughs> right. I feel, yeah. So let me ask you: when you you're an actor, you've been creating all the, and you're thinking, I can do this for myself, and then you have to sit down in front of a blank screen and create this right. character. What was that? I mean, what happened then? What, how did that feel? So with this particular one? Anything. I'm sure. talking about the beginning. When you just sat, Yeah, when you sat down at the very beginning, when you're like, I can do this, and then you realize this is really hard. But it's what, really hard. But what happened? <laughs> Maybe it's not hard for her, Sam. It's hard for everybody. Uh, <laughs> it's really hard. I'm not going to lie. Uh, no, it's, it's, I mean, I think every single thing I've written is different. It depends on where I get the inspiration from and how I have to create a character from it. But I always come at it from a character, like just because that's the way I've been trained. Mm -hmm. And so with this particular one, I came at it because I had personally gone through something that like changed my life. And I wanted to create a character whose life got turned upside down. And I mm. wanted to see how she swam out oh. from from it. Nice. And so I just kind of started to use some of my own history and stuff like that to create her. And then, yeah, and then her world was born. But usually that's kind of how I go for it. I, I think maybe because I'm an actor, I I love stepping into the shoes of the character so much. Mm -hmm. So if I read a story that really inspires me, I, I'll get in that person's shoes. And I'm like, ooh, what, what are they feeling? Like, how are they dealing with this? Like, you know, and I want to create a voice for them. And so some of those characters, some of those stories stick like glue and you just can't, you can't shake them. And those are the ones I know I have to write about. 
Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where it comes from. We should do that sometimes. That's really deep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like we should uh, we should segue right into this this show born out of this uh, transformative moment here. Yeah, sure. tell, tell us a little bit about it. All right. Well, here I'll give you the log line. It's, <laughs> it's a pretty crazy show. It's about a skeptical Generation Z who is forced to join the ancient family business of demon hunting. It's called The Watchers. And the show was created because my dad passed away about four years ago. And my whole life, like, turned upside down from one day to the next. Mm -hmm. He was the head of the family. Like, everything was always easy with him. And then he was gone. And my mom was like a wreck. And I was kind of left to pick up the pieces. Mm -hmm. So, getting emotional here. But um, (laughs) anyway, it's hard. But yeah. anyway, so because of that, my whole life literally got turned, like, flipped upside down. All of a sudden, I had to deal with the whole side of things that I just didn't know how to deal with. So the only way that I could deal with the fact that my dad was gone and I was dealing with all this stuff was I, I'm, I'm Hispanic. I come from a Hispanic family. I'm not religious. Like, I grew up in a Catholic home, but we weren't, like, we didn't go to church or anything like that. I, I went to Catholic school, and that's about all the church I attended. But we're very spiritual. And so I started to connect to that side of me as much as I could so that I could feel like I could close that door, so to speak, like to know that my dad was okay. And there was maybe there was another side and there was a bigger thing out there, you know, Mm -hmm. that I couldn't control. Mm -hmm. And so that's what comforted me. And so I started reading a ton of books about spirituality and mediums and people connecting to the other side and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, wow, like there's something cool here. So I wanted to, to write a story about somebody so to heal people's grief through her connection to another dimension. And so that's when I started to be, to create this character as a reflection of myself. Her name's Hannah. Once I started to build her world, I kind of realized that it would be easier to kill my demons, like my personal demons in a matter of speaking. If I told the story, I wanted to kill it in like a procedural setting, but it turned into like a fantasy horror show. <laughs> and so I just used all of my Hispanic and spirituality and <laughs> knowledge of dark magic and all this stuff <laughs> as like a, a, a basis for it. That is a tremendously good use of a painful personal experience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it really well, is. Thanks. And you know, the thing is, the, is it the Catholic church that you were raised in? I to was, yeah. yeah, to the extent that you're, and I mean, if there's anything more about fantasy and demons, mm-hmm. it's, I mean, Jim was raised. I, I was raised very Catholic. Very and, Catholic. So you understand. Yeah, well, and you, really, you can't do horror supernatural without the Catholic Church. It's just not the same. Exactly. <laughs> you, exactly. Like a Lutheran minister, no, you need a priest. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah absolutely. They've been, they've been so good at it. They're kind of like the Walmart of supernatural. Well, because they have every <laughs> totally. every aspect of it, there's there's going to be some version of it in some part of the church. Go well, because it, it's like the you know the church mm-hmm. went around and absorbed all the different pagan religions, right? So we got all the saints that right? used to be gods in somebody else's religion, right. and we just have like you know there's just a, a lot of basements to the church. You can just keep going down yeah. and hit other yeah. darker, weirder, stranger shit the deeper you go. Totally. So obviously that's. But to get back to the character, the idea of having a character come out of intense grief is great, not for us, the real people who are grieving, but, <laughs> but the, right. uh, you know, honestly, that's a big theme of what we're doing in our pilot that we are hoping to put the 12th draft to bed tomorrow. Tomorrow. Ooh, <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Tomorrow. And, uh, oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. It's so good. And I think we're, I think we're there, but, uh, it might stay in bed this time. It might. It just might. It might. Gotta... <laughs> Let's hope. Let's hope. <laughs> Thank you. Right. It might not, but, but yeah. the grief thing is very, and it's cause it's so, uh, Obviously, it's relatable, but it's also everybody's biggest fear. Yeah. Um, and it's all consuming, you know. It's, it's an overwhelming mm-hmm. 100%. emotion. 100%. And, you know, I have a, yeah. I'm married and I have a, two kids, and, and uh, my biggest fear is about my death is that it come too soon and suddenly. Not for me. I won't be around for it if it's mm-hmm. sudden, but is yeah, for my exactly. if right. it's is for my family. And uh, you know, we lost we lost my my wife's father suddenly. I mean, he was almost eighty nine, so it's, it's not like yeah. it was overdue. Due, but it was just one. one no, he just, but it's still. he just died in a, in an yeah. afternoon, and we had no intention of coming. And I I just I it was terrible, and I love the man deep dearly. But all I could think about is my daughters, and how do I protect them from this? And so that's why this, and I can't, you know, I, I, although I, I need to eat less fat and exercise more, but. That's other than that, <laughs> and not look at my phone while I'm crossing the parking lot. But the, uh, <laughs> but that that's the that's a deep vein, and you're absolutely right. That's where this whole thing has to start, and that's where you did. And so the, my question mm-hmm. is now to dive in. What's this? What happens in the pilot? And just in broad strokes. Yeah. How does yeah. how's the show work? 
Hannah has just graduated from, she's graduating from her bachelor's degree in physics. She's a scientist from like a really good university. She's just got a full ride to like a top university for a graduate program. And everything is coming up roses in her life until on the night of her 22nd birthday, her estranged brother shows up to tell her that their father passed away. Now, her mom passed away when she was a baby. So she was raised by her father and her brother. And so she's suddenly like completely paralyzed with grief. And he hands her a gift from her father. And when she puts it on, it causes some kind of like a strange clairvoyant vision. So she's like completely stunned by this like weird waking dream. What is the and thing that brother, she has from her brother, her father rather? What it's is it? That he, gave, he gives her a necklace. It belonged to her mother. Yeah. And when she puts it on, it causes her to have these like waking dreams. It like, it connects into something inside her right away. And so when she's like, what the hell's going on? Like how much did I drink? Because it was her grad night that she's thinking like she'd wasted or she doesn't know what the heck's happening. Plus she was stricken with grief. He has to inform her of her true family history that night too one that she never ever thought possible on their her 22nd birthday is when this is a very complex story so bear with me here we'll help Um, you with that (laughs) okay great it's gonna be less complex (laughs) when we're done (laughs) hopefully okay amazing thank you um so she's she's basically a uh a human angel hybrid okay and on her 22nd birthday that angel part of her starts to awaken and when she put that necklace on, everything woke up. And she comes from this, like, really old demon-hunting Nephilim called the Watchers. And so now all of a sudden, her family, like, she's forced to take her place in this family hierarchy where there are these Watchers, which are basically demon hunters, helping, like, spirits cross over and, and all of this stuff. But she's, like, a scientist, and she doesn't believe in any of it. So her whole life has just turned to chaos. And, she, like, she's Mulder and Scully in one person. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. <laughs> Who's she going to argue with, though? Her Is brother. Her, her brother. brother. And why are they estranged? Her mother was also a half angel hybrid. That's good. What's that's called? There's a word for that. Nephilim. That's yeah, Nephilim. Right. right. So her mother died when she was a baby, but the father was just a human, like a regular human, and he was trying to figure out what the heck happened to her. So he's basically been like trying to thread from her trail of what happened because it's crazy. And so the brother learned about this on his 22nd birthday too and kind of joined in with him and he's older than Hannah by four years when Hannah went away to university four years ago the brother had like turned just like the dad and her dad was like an embarrassment to her because he was all spiritual and she's a scientist and she didn't want anything to do with him so she picked a university far away from him and from her brother and didn't want anything to do with them just wanted to live her life away from them and so she hasn't seen her brother in four years so when he shows up it's like she started this new life away from them and doesn't want anything to do with him so it's just a really it's like a shock to see him and then a shock to find out that her father's dead and then the biggest shock of all is finding out what her actual history So this is all great. And there's a lot of stuff that we've seen before, but maybe in a different way. There's also a lot of stuff that's kind of folded in on itself. There's that maybe we can tease out. For example, it's all a question of how does all that backstory lead into front story? How is that something? Because all that has happened off screen. The only thing we're learning Mm -hmm. about, unless you're doing flashbacks, and and even then you're not going to do a million of them. So we're going to tell probably present time. Is that right? Is that your intention? Yeah, it's all in present time. There's one flashback, just the teaser. Okay. What you just talked about, a lot of that is just scaffolding for you. Um, So you can use it, lose it. Sometimes we'll have enormous amounts of scaffolding that is sometimes a Potential, and sometimes it's just writer masturbation because it's easier to come <laughs> up with that stuff than actually try to make a story work. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes, but it's also really important too. Uh, it's just a question of the process. I think of every every writer's different that way. And and the good thing is in this backstory they've constructed, there's really only two or three things you have to get out in the pilot to understand. Like, okay, right. well, the father's dead, and I have, I have questions about how he died because it sounds like that's a good mysterious reveal of some kind too. But you have the angelic parentage and the necklace, and her brother's in on it, and is going to be her sort of entry point God. into whatever this world is. Right. That's that's not too complicated. The hard thing for me is, yeah. and there's two pieces that I'm struggling with. One is, and I think it's the most important one, is the brother is the believer. But yeah. d- does he have the ability? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, she can only fight it for just lo- so long. The science component of it, the sort of the, the Scully part of the whole thing. Scully, by the way, I don't, nobody believed that she could fight it for as long as she did. Right. That was so, a, it was always a little yeah, problematic. Like, well, I can't long. believe, oh, come on. What do you need, woman? <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this for two and a half seasons. How many times do you have to get attacked by an alien before you say, hey, that's an alien? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, right. But, I mean, and that, you know, and that's why, uh, you know, it was... Uh, I think that's 
why X Files was such an unsuccessful show. Right. <laughs> and, and, that's right. And never managed to take <laughs> off and only lasted four episodes. There's always a buy. And Jim Jim's big mantra is that there you get one buy, right? You can't get two. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's his mantra and unfortunately I'm I have to live with that because he's my wife. But the thing that I um <laughs> but the thing that I uh I, I'm I'm strongly with is what is the relationship between the brother and yeah. the sister going forward that's that right. I'm gonna want to watch? And okay, and it, just yeah. tell me what that is. So, I mean, a short version. They become you know? part. They become partners in crime. So basically, they both decide that they. Once he tells her what happened with the father, and once she sees it through her clairvoyant visions or whatever, they know that they need to figure out what who this demon was that killed the father and the mother. And so they together go on this quest to avenge their parents. That's the plot, though. Yeah. What's the conflict? The conflict between them is that they have been. They've always been at odds. Like they're complete opposites. And so he wants her to do stuff but her moral code is very different than his moral code so he'll go and steal stuff and he'll go and do whatever it takes to get by but she's not okay with any of it so she wants to switch it up so there's always they're always butting heads but they have to be together because they're the only two people that know what they can they're actually capable of and like mm-hmm. what they're doing so it's really hard for them to not be together they have to be they're married essentially right but they're complete opposites so they don't like each other not really I mean, they, they're forced to be together. That that's that helps. That yeah, helps a lot. That helps a lot. And okay. that he he breaks every rule, and she's a rule follower. Is kind of my over yeah. oh, my gross which, oversimplification, which, which matches well with yeah. being a scientist, right? Following right. procedures yeah. and having strong a strong code and right. hierarchy of things. But I think that's true. And I don't know what the tone of the show is, but I think that's true when they're parking their cars. She waits for the guy to pull out, and he mm-hmm. goes around and steals the spot. You know, it's that kind yeah, of. Because totally. I'm looking for stuff for them to do in every scene right right or or many yeah. scenes how that, does this manifest mm-hmm. all the time that's very specific to him and very specific to her and they may in the end you'll have that moment where you, we realize they do love each other but that yeah. doesn't mean they like each other and that's the show exactly. all right so exactly. that okay thank you just took us a while to catch up now thank you <laughs> and now now my net my next thing and you may not like this and jim may not agree i'm bumping hard on the necklace and i'll tell you why the necklace is a gift, meaning it, mm-hmm. she didn't earn it. it. It doesn't have much cost, and she has a lot of control over it. She could choose to put it on or not put it on. And so yeah. this is always the question with talismans, and Jim and I have talked about talismans a lot. And They're a crutch. They're, they can be really a crutch, and they feel simplistic in a lot of a lot of ways. And they really are only helpful to the writer, I think. This is not a rule. This is just you know being a, sci- yeah. a supernatural fan. Is when they mess things up, not when they help you. And you have two obvious alternatives to it that are, are baked into your story already, which is either the power comes to her on the death of the father, and she doesn't know where it comes from, and then it's you know two days later the brother shows up or something like that. Right. Or it is you know calendar timed to her twenty second birthday. Which feels a little wonky to me, but you know that could be. That could or be the death of the father yeah. might have done it, but well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, the death that, of the father is right. The, oh yeah, that, I think the first that's version. the main one. Yeah, but I, I, I mm-hmm. but then I want to add a except in my in the way I think about talismans, which is you don't give it to her right away so she has to earn it somehow and earn it i don't mean in the she has to you know jump through three pools of fire to get it i don't mean anything like that but be, she's reacting to the fact that her whole life is turned upside down both by the death of her father and not only is he dead but now you have to pick up the mantle with me the brother that i you don't like which is great mm-hmm. and then in the process of doing all this because of their efforts they find this thing that then lets them talk to yeah. their lost father right or the lost mother or whatever which right? has some mm-hmm. benefit like that Benefit and problem. And the problem, I think, in this version could be, number one, obviously the obvious problem is there's going to be a plot problem or something gets worse or like, oh, I'm so glad you finally got a hold of me. By the way, you're now completely fucked in this whole brand new way <laughs> that you don't know about. And the other one is, and this is the money really, is when he she gets to talk to her father, right. which and, will break my heart. And the father is in hell because the demon took him there and the season arc is getting the father out. Well, that, or some, that's beautiful. Some stuff like that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah, of course that's it. Yeah. Of course that's so beautiful. That's great. Jim is not going to come up with a new thing. Come on. <laughs> well, you're coming up with a new thing. I love the talisman. I think that's really. Well, that's just that's just because dorks sitting around talking about talismans, and we've done it for a long time. And so, yeah, well, welcome it. to our writers' room. This is what writers' room is. Yeah, yeah, that is what writers. But I've always wanted. <laughs> Yes, and you always have the writer saying, he won't say, he or she won't say this part. While no one was talking to me in 8th, ninth, or 10th grades, I was right. actually really interested in this thing. And and then everyone else in the room is just looking like, yeah, that's cool. You're a dork, <laughs> but you're cool. Yeah, because... <laughs> 
in the land of the dorks. <laughs> um, oh, man. And so, and that's why we love Writer's Room so much because we get to talk about this stuff. But um, so that's the challenge with the necklace right away. And you haven't pitched the story of it. And I'm, your story, might, I might hear it and go like, oh, I'm an gotcha. idiot. That makes, that's so awesome. But those are the things that we think about when we're thinking about that. And, and for your pilot, like, it's very flexible in that sense, mm-hmm. right? Like, if, if you took it out of being a gift off the top from the brother, that can be the thing mm-hmm. that gets won at the end and is the prize and gets to see the father and that kind of thing, right? Could be, yeah. Pretty much what I just said. Um, Right now I have it. (laughs) Right now I have it as, it's more like a waking dream where she's just these pieces of things. So I'm using it as like a, the audience can see a flashback through it. You know what I mean? Like it'll take her, so like I can see what happened to the dad. And so that way we know that what she's watching, but then the audience also learns how the dad died. Mm-hmm. Like that's the way I'm using it, but I can have it. Like she can't talk to people through it at this point, but I like that idea. You know what's cool is uh, in that is what you what you I think you said is that it's not perfect. She's getting glimpses, so it's not too yeah. gifty. No, you know I mm-hmm. I would challenge you to consider the idea, and just because we're pitching this alternate take on the, the talisman, but you know the idea of she's having her graduation party and she's she's half in the bag and whatever, hanging out with her friends, and then just starts getting sailed by visions mm-hmm. that are flickering in and mm-hmm. out, and she's moving in and out it seems between a couple different worlds and then she's seeing her father being killed or whatever that is like yeah that feels more organic and more like it's going to mess with her head than putting on a necklace you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah that's yeah, the like gifty that. thing sam's talking about we're just yeah, like, oh, yeah, yeah. here's the magic necklace and now you're gonna have a vision kind of thing right okay i like that yeah we were on a show called Dead Zone. Yes, Steven I remember King. the Dead Zone. It was shot here. Oh, that's right. In Vancouver. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Except and our season, which except is Montreal. Our, yeah, they moved it to Montreal. <laughs> oh. but, uh, but yes, and so Dead Zone, you know, Johnny, the lead, uh, he had, for anybody who doesn't know it, he would touch people and he would see. Or objects. Or objects, right. And he would see a, pe- a fragment that he couldn't control of whatever the power was trying to tell him. Right, past, future, Something about where that object had been or where that person had been or done. Yeah. And the thing that worked for that was he couldn't control it. Sometimes he could, sometimes he couldn't. He was he didn't like touching things because he didn't know what was going to come. So he, <laughs> he re- cause he, it, 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 it was never a gift. It was always, this is creating a problem. And then right. he right. would use those problems to ultimately solve the problem. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah, I think that could work well. Well, I would go watch a few episodes of that because it was a uh, it ran five seasons and it, or six, and it was really effective using that structure. And so, right. even if your show's nothing like it, you could totally yeah. steal the structure <laughs> if you wanted to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Yeah. Okay, I'm definitely going to go watch some episodes of that. I really like that idea that it's more organic in her instead of a necklace that gets put on because I can totally incorporate all of that into what I already have in the pilot. Great. Yeah. So that's great. So what should we talk about next? Should we talk about where we're going to get to at the end of this? Where yeah, let's, let's talk about the, the end of the pilot. Yeah, yeah. What, what's the shape of sure. the story? Because it's the only story that okay. exists. Okay, it's the only story that exists. So they're, they're chasing, she sees this demon that killed her father in this glimpse and the brother then knows exactly what it is because he doesn't have that clairvoyant power. Like, even if he puts on the necklace, it doesn't work for him. I'll change that now to organic. But. Oh, I, I like that, though. I like that she, he can't do the same thing she does. He has the knowledge of the world, which she doesn't have, but she has the visions and he doesn't. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's, That's cool. good. So because she's able to see that, he's like, I know exactly what it is you have to come with. And this demon is like hiding in this, in this ghost in the, in the Hotel Vancouver. So what I was using was like some Canadian lore, ghost lore, because the demons in my world have to come in through ghost vessels. Through what? I'm sorry. Through what? Through like a ghost vessel, like a, a vessel, you know, in purgatory kind of thing, like a, a ghost that hasn't crossed over yet. Okay. So those vessels are able to house a demon in my world. All so right. the demon can come through those ghosts. So there's a, go- a famous ghost in Vancouver. Vancouver, at the Hotel Vancouver, this woman that wears a red dress that was apparently killed right in front of the hotel. And her ghost kind of lives in this massive hotel we have in the center of town. And so I put this demon inside her, and that's where the father was killed inside this hotel, in one of the hallways by the demon. So they go in to hunt the demon. Um, he teaches her how to use the angel sword and teaches her how to like do all the spiritual stuff, and they get their witch friend to help them. Wait, they witch up, friend? Yeah, so they're because they're Hispanic, they have like spiritual healers like in their life. And the reason that the mom... I I know, it's very complex. That, that is, <laughs> yeah, well, hold on a second. Hold on. JR, I'm turning to another Hispanic person. 
<laughs> JR, <laughs> so, do you have witch friends? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have brujas. <laughs> yes, yeah, brujas. Wow. Of course. All right. It's this part is... of our, our spiritual culture. So that's part of the thing. Yes. And the things put in there. Yeah. Because you want to, I wanted to kind of bring that to light. The family is Hispanic. And I wanted to kind of incorporate some of that Hispanic spirituality I've never seen on screen before. So. That That's fantastic. Let, let me ask. So it, it sounds like, are you going to, this is a very TV thing, but are you kind of building a team here of people we're going to see regularly yes. fixing these problems? Okay. Yes. That's great. Yes. Yeah. So they've got the two brother, the brother and sister, and then they have their the bruja who helps them with special stuff that they can do. You know, that's the, the secret weapon that they have is this witch who helps. The witch kind of gives them a bunch of stuff and like these bags that they can throw at the demons and it'll send them back. So it, it helps them kill the demon off. So they kill off that demon. They think they sent it back to hell anyways. They haven't killed it for real. They just sent it back to hell and they go back home at the end of the night to kind of wrap their head around this huge adventure that they just went on together. And Hannah goes back to her room to relax and when she walks in there she turns the light on and there's somebody sitting on the end of the bed and it's her father and it looks just like her father and she goes in and they have this moment of like where she's like oh my god dad like I'm so sorry I didn't believe you I can't believe like I, I went through all of my life thinking you were crazy like now I believe everything that you did but it's not her father it's just a demon in her father's clothing essentially and her brother comes in and saves her from this demon at the end and, and then her father tur- it turns into we... that demon in this moment the father turns into the demon in right. the moment and oh, yeah. He's covered in demon guts. And so, uh, that's kind of wow. No, no, this is, that's really heavy. <laughs> I just want to ask a rule thing here. So if, if the demon's coming through ghosts, does that mean there was a ghost at the end of her bed that the demon was in? Yes. It's her yeah. father. Her yeah. father's the ghost. Is, mm-hmm. is it her father's ghost? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, He's the vessel. Yeah, I haven't come up. I, I, it, it, it could be the father's ghost. It doesn't have so to be. I haven't made that. Otherwise, you got it, a shape shifting ghost. Right. So that, that, it's a shape shifting demon type. There's oh, two wait a minute. Types call, in the wait, world. hold on. We just oh. we just threw a flag. flag on the play. Flag on the play now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's so just, let, let, this, in these really complicated things, you want to keep whatever rules you have as simple as you possibly can. And, and the whole, okay. you know, soul in purgatory ghost kind of thing as a vessel for demons is interesting. I haven't seen that particular thing before that I can remember, but it kind of makes sense. As, as someone stuck halfway between the worlds, it's a way for the demons to come in. That sort yeah. of makes a simple sense that you could explain and it's consistent in the world. But then if you're going to have demons, that's got to always be the case. And the shape-shifting thing to just look like her father. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's really her father, but then he gets taken over by the demon in the moment when they're talking, yeah. that could work. Okay, mm-hmm. I like that. There's a lot of, lot of Jim's right, which, you know, that hurts to say, so I must really mean it. because I've never the, heard it before. Yeah, the, the thing that... <laughs> It's the rules. I, for me, it's not about just conflict of the rules. That's part of it. It's just that there's too many of them. Yeah. And that those are both important, but then you start blowing people's minds. And also, it, mm-hmm. it, it kind of diffuses the whole thing. That's the problem. You right. start you start thinking about the wrong things. You're not thinking about the characters. You're thinking about what are the rules, and we don't want anybody to think about Got the it. rules. And, and, and this is Got where it. this is important because as you, as you come to the end of a script— especially a pilot, or as you come to the end of a season of TV, you want to stop laying fresh track and just be hitting on things that you've already taught the audience. You don't yeah. have to think about anything except the emotional impact, what you're trying to sell right there. So if you've already taught them that the woman in red had a demon in her because she was a ghost, and then she sees her father's yeah. ghost and a demon is in him, I don't. I understand yeah. it, and I don't have to think about it. And what does the demon say in Got that it. time? Because yeah, whatever he says is, a, is, I mean, is he saying something like, we're going to come get you over the course of the next season one? I mean, is it, he's He's laying out, obviously that's shitty, and I don't mean literally that, but it's, is he setting up season one I'm for taking you? your father with me. Yeah. What I have right now, the demon doesn't speak at all. She just starts talking, embraces him. He's a bit stiff, like, you know, right. she, she starts chatting. She starts just like unleashing all of her guilt on him and her grief. And before he says anything is when the brother comes in and kills him. Well, I think you have an opportunity there to lead yeah. to set up the next episode of the, or the season arc, right? Yeah, that, that would be great. That's where I'm having trouble. So I'm really grateful for this. Yeah, whatever it is, like, because it's such an emotional moment to give her the the gift of the, in the course of a story, having defeated a demon, having ac- accepted to whatever extent her place in this new world of magic and, and angels and all this stuff, to walk in and have just that moment of reprieve with her father who she's grieving so much, and then yeah. it's snatched from her as a demon possesses the father and for example, says, this is the bad version, not what they would actually say, but uh, your father's with me now in hell. Come get him. Right. Or, or whatever yeah. that is. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And well, then then all kinds of things come loose and there's emotional investment on the character's part and, right. and it kind of makes your heart 
hurt to see that happen. It's it's good. Mm -hmm. It's good structure. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Thank you. That was very helpful because I was very stuck there. Like I knew I wanted to see the dad and I wanted them to have that moment of like, whoo, you know, the grief come out and then something really shitty happens. Sorry, excuse my language. But yeah, I love, I love that. And the thing is, at the end of the pilot is all about asking questions and uh, leaving, mm -hmm. asking a question and leaving. not answering it. And that, so that I have to, I have to ask you what the hell is going on, and, you know, and then the executive or the showrunner, whoever it is, you know, has to say, Giovanna, what the hell? <laughs> What's, what's going, what what's was next? that? What's next? And that's what you want. Right. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, this it, endings are hard. And j on this, this script that we're writing 12 versions of, we finished the rough version of 12. And uh, I was talking to Jim yesterday morning and uh, I had rewritten the ending based on what we had talked about. And he then did a polish on my rewrite. And, and then he called me and said, or, or I called him and he said, I want to change the ending. <laughs> and all he did was, it was great. As soon as he pitched me, I was like, yep, 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 that's better. Because we had something about a family and it was a little treacly. It was a little sweet. They, they got the reunion at the end. Mm. And, and, and we didn't right. want that. And so instead he said, let's cut it off before that. And, and then the obvious answer is go too far the other way. And so they won't get it. And he said, let's, let's, go, let's go out on the question. And that was it. And I know that's the right one. So this is always, and we've done many, many versions of this ending. JR had on draft six, JR was like, this is the ending, man. Do not change this. We threw it out. Threw it out. So, and I'm oh, still man. fighting for that. <laughs> oh, man. man. Yeah. So uh, he hasn't read this new draft yet, though. We, it's just it's wow. the process. It's the process of yeah. it. But, and you don't have to solve that problem. All right. So we covered the necklace. We covered all that. I'm going to ask you, can I step away from the pilot for a second? I just of want course. to know, have you ever dealt with a writer as the actor on set? Mm -hmm. uh, no. No, okay. uh, Actually, yes, I have. I have only on sitcom work, though, because we'd get notes halfway through the day and then go back, back to work. After and then, okay. Notes, so. Because, I, well, you know, it's tricky when you're the writer on set. Um, it's really the, the director's uh, world. world, and you're, you're there to advise, mm -hmm. and I generally try not to talk. You're not supposed to talk to the actors uh, by Direct. But inevitably you do. Of course you do, especially if you're <laughs> on the show for a while and you get to have a relationship with them and the directors come in and out, and but you're steady there all the time. And uh, some directors want you to talk to them. Some directors don't. The director's guild rules are that they don't, that you don't, uh, yeah. without the permission. And sometimes I'll have a director. I'll go give the note to the director, and the director will say, well, hold on a second. Why don't you wait here? And then he, he motions the actor over, and we have a conversation about it. So there's ever, there's a million wow. different ways, but I've never heard it from the right, from the actor's perspective like how does it feel to yeah. get that note so i know how they feel about getting notes but how mm -hmm. does how do they work in that dynamic because it's it's a it's an awkward dynamic on on the set i don't know i mean personally as an actor getting notes from a writer i would be so happy especially having coming from now writing my own shows and my own stuff i see just how like involved you are in the world i mean it's your world you know almost the writers like you've created these crazy things and all these you know so you really know it so well like i long as an actor to get notes from a writer to be quite honest like when i'm reading a, a new a fresh pilot or something i'm like man i wish i could talk to the writer for like five minutes so they could give me anything you, you know you don't know what and you've so, just oh. unleashed <laughs> <laughs> uh, well i'm glad because it's the truth it, it, the insight that you get from a writer is so amazing as an actor you get the story it's funny because like that's that's usually the conversation I, I know i wind up having with actors when i'm on set which is there, there's two there's two pieces of the character right as the writer and part of the writer's room and all of that we're looking out for the entire show and long arcs of characters and all that kind of stuff and the actor is shepherding just that role and they remember the last scene that that character was in and how they responded to things and so they can can help shape and guide and, and remember things that sometimes the writers even forget about what's going on with the character on the flip side we help protect them from making choices that hurt the long arc of the story that they don't even necessarily know about so if it's exactly. good synergy to me yeah no it really can Absolutely. be okay so back to your pilot there's <laughs> one other thing i want to talk about that i think is really important uh which is the latino or hispanic latinx i don't know latin <laughs> latin, latin. 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 Yeah. latin. Yeah. learned that one yesterday. <laughs> yeah. yesterday but um ah. you know you're sitting you're talking to you know a jewish guy and a catholic white guy irish guy so to me as soon as you started talking about the latinx what do we what, what am i saying Jerry? latin latino or latin okay as soon as we start talking about the latin version of it my interest went up 50 percent 
Yeah. Because, oh, that's exciting. Yeah, because, you know, we've seen a lot of shows like this because we watch a lot of television like this. We're, we're passionate about this. I mean, we write straight drama, but we like Supernatural. We've created a Supernatural show. The thing is, when you put your spin on it that way, mm-hmm. I really got interested. And I would love that to be, if it, if it works in your, and of course, everything is up to you, of course. But mm-hmm. if it worked for how you conceive it, I'd like to know that on page one or two. Yeah. It's, 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 in, it's in the teaser, like right off the top. Great. Great, great. Because it, it takes you to its specificity. It takes you to a corner of it, like because Supernatural ran for thirty-seven seasons or whatever it was, yeah. you know, and and <laughs> Buffy and all that stuff. Like we've seen yeah. a lot of this world versions of it, so mm-hmm. the specific flavors help a lot. And and the thing I think that's so interesting about it, of course, is because the Latino culture is bound up in the Catholic Church so much in a way yeah. that yeah. I only I know that intellectually, but I've not right. experienced that, and I'm very curious about it. Yeah. And I think that would be really interesting to explore. Also, uh, you know, Giovanna, if this is part of who you are, then it's your voice. Right. And then when yeah. it's a writing sample, that's going to be a huge plus to a smart showrunner uh, who's looking for, like, how do, how do I get as many voices in here? So when I'm telling a story, it's a kaleidoscope. Or, or development executives who are yes. looking at, at a potential property and going, oh, well, this is a unique voice from a, a genuine perspective. You have the right to tell the story, which is great. Yeah. And the thing about it is we're, we're, we're all learning about this and we're trying to figure out because you don't want to be, I'm Latina, so therefore I must write. <laughs> Latina right. stories. And they're the only stories I can legitimately yeah, tell. Right. right? Like, but right. but on the other hand, these stories not only must need to be told from a political standpoint, from an evolutionary, you know, so socially evolutionary perspective, but also I've seen all the other, a lot of other versions. Right. <laughs> the, the, the reason it's important, like right. the, these, you know, quote unquote, new voices are saying stuff we haven't heard a hundred times, which is great. Great. And, right. and that would be a, a right. ton of fun. And in we've certainly seen, like, go back to the Omen, one of the you know, one of the originals. They in the Omen that was, you know, it was obviously in the church. It was a bunch of white Anglo people dealing with that. But the scariest stuff was in the church, or when they went to the yeah. Holy Land, uh, which was. You think of the Exorcist? No, yeah. I've never seen the Exorcist that way. Well, I'm, thinking, right. I'm thinking of. Um, I've only seen the Exorcist in pieces, the but the Omen was. Uh, uh, remember the baby, and uh, they went to. They found the jackal buried where. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, all yeah. that stuff. But yeah, the jackal. Wow. Re- regardless of all that, it, it was just so great because it was in the church with the white yeah. people. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. and, but their relationship to the church was very not, no one believed that stuff. But yeah. I have a feeling that based on what you and JR were just talking about, the Latino community is going to be a lot more open to this, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Than these repressed I, British yeah. people in, uh, <laughs> in the Omen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. And, I mean, it totally stems from everything I grew up with. Uh, Even great. like my house was literally covered, no joke, in pictures of the angels, like everywhere I looked. And so I added that into the pilot because they're obviously part angels. And so when she goes back home and looks around and realizes that these angels are actually part of her hand, she's like, oh my God. It's like family I just portraits. thought this was like weird. Yeah, I thought this was just like weird Hispanic <laughs> spiritual crap, you know? <laughs> like what? Well, you anyway. say weird Hispanic spiritual crap, and I hear five, five seasons of television. Television. Right. <laughs> so like, right, so well, that's good to hear. Right. Um, also, uh, you know, you said she's a scientist, right? You went down mm-hmm. the, you know, Scully way, but it's not just scientists. She's actually rejecting her that side of herself. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's her more in, that to me. That's more unique and interesting than scientist versus believer versus non-believer because it's specific mm-hmm. to her. So why is she rejecting? all those pictures on the wall and what the stuff her mother did and father did and whoever, why did she reject it? I'm almost more interested if she has a white boyfriend and she, yeah, she and she's changed her last name uh, to, you know, something. Smith. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, and, and these are terrible pictures, but the idea being that's the core of who she is. And now she's yeah. got to go back to that, but she is a scientist and she is educated and she is less suspicious, superstitious, but she was raised mm-hmm. in it and it's part yeah. of her culture. And where do you separate out the culture and the faith and the family? And that I would really be interested yeah. in. It, it would be great if in some way all that science stuff somehow turned out to be a force multiplier for her in this world. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that looks like. And I'm not, I don't want her building, you know, the holy hand <laughs> of Antioch or something, but, but it's just some, it would be cool if somehow she that knows enhanced. a lot. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah, I love that. I, I do include like a little, like she talks very science like when she's telling her that this stuff happens and she's like, no, that's that's impossible because matter, blah, blah, blah. Like, but why is she, and, and, and just to belabor the point, <laughs> why is she going down the science road? Because she's repressing herself. Exactly. And her heritage. Exactly. It's a deep yeah. repression. 
So she's finding herself. That's the whole theme of the, of the show is, is essentially finding out who you truly are. And, and that's fun. And being and, okay with that, you know? And as two fans here of Supernatural stuff, the idea of that POV on this is super exciting um, and super interesting. So, uh, so I, you know, I, re I recognize it's two white guys saying, hey, can you let Tino this thing up a little bit? <laughs> no, I love no, it. I'm, but, I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah, but I think it's super interesting. We're just, we're, we're just telling you to lean into what's already there. Yeah, that's right. right. You put it in really? there. Yeah, thank you. Giovanna, is, uh, have we helped you? Is there anything else? That, you have uh, helped me so much, really so much. I, it, it's hard when you're sitting by yourself staring huh. at a computer screen, coming up with crazy worlds all alone, and yeah. to finally get to actually chat it out with two people that are such experts at it. It's been wonderful. Thank you. You're really letting me see what I can do. You know, there's so much here, and now that I think we found, we just all we're adding, asking you to do is put a little salt on yeah, the right. flavors that you already have. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's it's great. And I think, what's the name of it, by the way, besides, now I'm going to say, I know you, okay. it says the, the, the Watchers, right? Mm -hmm. But if you are leaning into that. Yeah, you might want to find you something in Spanish. Find something, not, or not, if not it's Spanish, it's specific to that world, something that I would wonder about. You know, the in, in Buffy, the Watchers, the librarian in Buffy, who was sort of the, her guide, was from an mm -hmm. organization called the Watchers. Which was something that uh, that struck me when I saw your episode title. Where like you I said, you, you've entered Nerdville here, so right. <laughs> like we're, we're we're gonna know that stuff. And um, but you know, when you and Jr. were talking, I felt like for just a second, I felt like, oh, I'm I'm on the outside looking in here. This is like a whole, <laughs> and that that you can get that yeah. in the title. Like, come check this out. You don't know, understand what I'm about to show you. Okay. And okay, I'm intrigued yeah, by that. that. Um, really cool. And people that wouldn't be, I don't think those are the people you want to hang with. Um, yeah. right. <laughs> Cause they already have a specific okay. worldview. And I think that is a terrible, when writers come in and they are, they think they know the world, they're not open. And that's going to mm -hmm. be, that's a, that's a tough way to write. Jovan, it's super, it was, thank you so cool. much for coming today. It was great to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you both so much for having me and they are, it was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, Jovan. Bye. And that's all we've got for you this week. Our producer, J.R. Zamora Thal, is working the mixing board. Our logo was designed by Julianne DeBar Moncler, and our music was provided by Budarays out of Austin, Texas. If you want to get in touch, we are at The Salmon Gym on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find us on Facebook and YouTube as The Writer's Room with Salmon Gym. And if you like hanging out in the room with us, give us a follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And tell a friend, would you, so we can get JR paid. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.